All right, what's up, Facebook? Good morning, good morning. I'm your friendly neighborhood quarantine pastor, Joe Wyrostek, and I'm ready to preach the word to you today. Would you please share this message if you are getting it right now on your feed or tag some folks that you know and love because I have a word for you today about overcoming the world. I'm coming right out of our our live Zoom meeting where we meet with our elders and deacons and our disciples in 101 and 201. And if you're a local Chicagoan and would like to join us in that meeting that is interactive with worship and testimony and prayer and prophetic words, would you chat your name right now and we'll get you in there. There is only one stipulation that you join our discipleship. We want disciples as our church to gather in that Zoom meeting. And so if you are willing to be discipled and become a part of our virtual church, we'll get you that link and you can join us next week and see all that God is doing behind the scenes. And like everybody else in Illinois, we are still meeting online with all of our life groups, all the way from children to adults and everything in between for the teenagers, okay? And our Sunday services, you can see, are here. I do want to speak a quick word word to you that I stand against what our governor and mayor is doing and that I promote passive resistance to anyone that disagrees whether you're a small business owner or whether or not you're a family member that wants to get together with your family or a boater or any of these other ridiculous laws our governor and mayor are enforcing. I do believe there are times from the pulpit that we have to call the sound of protest and I encourage anyone who wants to join in protest or writing or calling or voicing their disagreement towards our governor, to the senators, to the local leaders, the mayors, please do so because our rights are being violated in Illinois. There is no science behind the quarantine, the way it's being done in Illinois. There is nothing wrong with those of us who have already been quarantined to get together in smaller groups with our immediate family from other homes or our neighbors. There is nothing scientific that says that we will put a stress upon the hospital systems. Also, to have the parks wide open in outdoor spaces, letting us quarantine ourselves, keeping our own social distances. There is nothing in science that says that it will put a stress upon our health system. And for boaters and others to get out with multiple people, they want to limit to only two, so forth and so on. There is nothing scientifically that says that will cause an issue. This is dictatorship. This This is socialism and what it looks like. So to you and your conscience, let you be between you and your God. I know in ways that I'm going to passively resist this. And uh, as a church congregation, we're not going to open our doors or our life groups to the public because I do not want a lawsuit with our mayor and with our governor that will take and occupy my time from the gospel to, to, uh, to then have to defend that. But I would support any pastors who would do that in this city. You have the right to gather. That is a constitutional right. And you have the freedom of religion. I also think that it could be stretched to even small businesses, but I leave that between you and God. Now, I will do what's right between me and God. And I want to say this as well. I know that our law enforcement and many of our law enforcement agree with me, but they are put in a difficult place. Maybe they might have to issue tickets. Maybe they might have to issue citations and so forth. I am praying for you as first responders, as you and your departments have to deal with this. I pray that it doesn't put you in an uncompromising position because I know many in Illinois are like me. They do not agree with this. And so I'm praying for Uh, those in the park districts and others that you would also be uh, willing to take some kind of a stand or maybe to overlook what you see as these violations because you know these are violating the constitutional rights of Americans. Some might say, well, this is not full-blown persecution and so we shouldn't take it that serious. My friends, these are the steps they use until full-blown persecution. They try to take as many rights as they can without you putting up a fight and then by the time they've taken these last rights you have nothing left to fight with come on somebody if you've studied history you understand that so I am opposed to what our governor has done for the month of May I am opposed to how they are labeling in our city deaths from COVID when they have come out and purposely said it's only things that they can prove only science can prove death with COVID 
Even the head over Chicago Medical, she said that if a person was on hospice and they were going to die in two weeks and yet they died with COVID, we would say from COVID. And that's what the news keeps reporting and they need to stop doing that. Of course, there may be certain deaths that come from COVID, but all of these deaths are not from COVID. A great majority of them are with COVID. And as our state does all of this massive testing, of course the numbers of infections are going to grow. As they did in California, random tests, they saw that many, many more people had it. And yet they were asymptomatic, and yet it wasn't even that serious if they did have it. So I stand strong with our brothers and sisters like Raven in New Orleans, who are going out and reaching the homeless. Others in Florida who are having church services and who God is blessing. And Texas, who is willing to open up in Georgia. And here's the deal. If you don't want to do that, stay quarantined. Stay in a bubble. That's up to you. But I have to speak as a leader to this nation for such a time as this. And I do believe, and I'm not a conspiratorial person, but I do believe there are powers of darkness at work behind the scenes manipulating minds. Because why is it, just think of it just for a moment, why is it the most liberal states with the most oompa loompa governors, the most pro-abortion, pro-homosexual leadership are the same ones enforcing this kind of strong totalitarian quarantine? New York, who just legalized partial birth abortion, that lunatic Cuomo, is it any coincidence he's a lunatic in quarantine and he does not even give God any credit for subsiding the destruction among the people. Is there any wonder that Pritzker, who himself wants partial birth abortion here and has pushed for, and California, and etc. Is any coincidence these men and women are wicked and they do not have a good intentions for us as a nation or for us as a Christian people. And so as a Christian people, we should be able to speak to powers and be their conscience. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, as he passively resisted the wicked government of that time and the wicked governors of that time. So I leave that between you and God. May your conscience be clean. May your conscience be clean in this time. So do not be uh, forced into positions against your conscience. We have seen people protest for things all throughout history and the American history. This is one of those times for us to stand up, to write our governor, to write our mayor, to passively resist. They can't arrest us all, amen? Uh, to go to the parks, to go to families and small groups safely on your own decision, not being forced by others. That's up to you. I'm going to make my decision in that. How many are ready for First John? Can I hear an amen? Chat an amen if you're ready. Some people might say, well, Pastor, I wish you wouldn't get into politics. Well, you sound just like the devil then. Because that's what I heard the devil say. He doesn't want the church in politics. Because if the church is not in politics, then who is in politics? Everybody has a worldview, people. Everybody has a point of view that they're putting their foundation on. My foundation is the word of God. And you can't take it out of my hands when I come into the political arena. Just like I don't ask anyone else to take out their worldview. Come with your worldview. I'll come with my worldview. Let's see who's better in the end. Let's see who has more sense and who science is behind and who uh, economic growth is behind and, and blessing to a nation is behind. I stand on this and I will forever stand on this. Whether I'm in pol discussing politics, whether I'm discussing the economy, or whether I'm discussing whether or not we're going to go out to eat today. Whatever we do is going to come from this. Amen? We're a Bible people. We're centered on the word of God. And we are their conscience, and it's a government for the people and by the people. Amen? It's, it's, it's us keeping them accountable. And so we ought to do that. We ought to do that. Now, to a message that might be a little bit unrelated, but I can guarantee you I'll relate it today. We're going to be talking about uh, being overcomers because we're born of God. 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 21 says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So that's where we're going to get that concept, born of God. And then later on down there, if you look at verse 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. That's the message today. So I want to end today's sermon series on 1 John by going through the whole chapter, and I'm going to take it section by section. I don't feel like reading. I don't feel it's going to be best to read all 21 verses 
So I'm going to read chunk by chunk, and hopefully we'll be able to get through it all today. And let me just say this, because I got wound up, forgot to mention these two other announcements. If you would like to give, we have a giving link up right now. You can do so. Thank you for your generosity during this time. And if you need help during this time, anything that we can offer as a church, let us know. We're here for you. Uh, the website is down. I guess it caught the coronavirus. My people are working on it. Go, Daddy. Hopefully it'll be up soon. So the notes are not there, but I have them here for you guys today. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. Let's get into it. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Now, let me just break it down a little bit here, section by section. Right here we see what I was referring to last week, that God is love and that we are to love like God. But our love is not just any kind of love. Love has a definition that corresponds to God's character and his commands. What we just read confirmed that which we learned last week. So if you say, I love God's children, we all God's children, I love everybody, you don't love according to the Bible. First of all, the Bible doesn't say everybody's God's children. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. As God's creation, we must be born again as his children. So how are we born again? By believing in Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, the chosen one. That's how we are born of God. And then we have him and the Father. And so we have to also believe in the Trinity. So this can't be any old God. It's the, it's, it's the God of the Bible who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then when we say we love each other, it's not just in some kind of Jim Jones cult love or uh, a free-for-all like Oprah's love. No, it's a love that keeps God's commands. Now let's keep going into verse 3. Look at what it says. It says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. So if you've ever thought to yourself that keeping God's commands was a burden, you were not doing it right. Doing Christianity right does not feel like you're carrying a burden. It feels like someone is carrying a burden for you. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my load is light and you shall find rest for your souls. Now you might say, pastor, I thought there was suffering in Christianity. I thought we carried the cross. What, what is that? That is not in the heart according to obedience. That is according to you not giving into your flesh and when people hurt you. But in your heart, you should be full of joy to want to keep God's commands. In other words, people can hurt you and your flesh can sometimes feel discomfort, but your heart should always be full of joy, full of glory, full of peace, patience, all the fruit of the spirit and full of God's presence. And so those of you who get that mixed up, who you think keeping God's commands hurts and you think people help who are in the world because they try to ease your guilty conscience, you've got it backwards. Keeping God's commands should be a joy. And when sinners come against you and try to hurt you, that's normal because they hurt Jesus because he was so holy. Remember, you don't put somebody on a cross that you love. You put somebody up there you hate that convicts you of sin all the time. And so we have to get this right according to the scriptures. The commands of God are not a burden. And even the burdens that we do carry, like suffering in this world, what people do against us, dying to the flesh, sacrificial living, the Bible says he carries literally with us as a strong ox would be brought together with a weaker ox or a younger ox to pull the cart. God is that strong ox that carries our burdens for us. That's what Jesus said. And he said that when we are in this relationship as being born again children of God, loving him, loving others as our vision is, loving God and loving people, we're going to naturally keep his commands. And as we do all of that, the Bible says, we overcome the world. 
And look at what it continues to go on to say. This is the victory. We just had a new baby girl born to Mary and Daniel in our church and they named her Victory. What a beautiful name. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that powerful that all of this is done by faith in Jesus? Now remember, this is the last chapter. So in your mind, go back to chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. What did we learn? We learned that Jesus actually came in the flesh, that John saw him and touched him. He could hear him. This is not a myth. They saw him die. They saw him raised from the dead. They were there the day the Holy Spirit came like Pentecost, keeping the word of Jesus that he would send the Holy Spirit another like him to be with him forever, right? So this process, this event, we would call the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the sending of the Holy Spirit is something that now we believe by faith. We weren't there like John to see all of those events, but we believe. And why do we believe? Do we believe blindly? Are we just wishing? Do we have make-believe? Are we wishing upon a star? When I was at Disney World with my children and I saw the presentation they do at the end, it's quite amazing. And then Tinkerbell uh, comes, you know, whooshing down on the zip line from the, the castle up there all the way down and there's pixie dust being thrown everywhere. Is, is that what we're doing? Is that literally what? No. We're having faith in the facts that the apostles claim to have seen. Remember this, faith is in fact. Faith is not in fiction, and faith is not in faith itself. You're not just having faith in this thing called faith, you're having faith in facts. Let me give you an example of some facts in the Bible. God is creator. In, in the Bible, we're given the idea that God creates. Now, let's see if we can test that. Is there anything we know of in the universe that can come from nothing uncreated? Anything we can think of? No. So it is a fact that everything we see has to come from something. So if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere, the ultimate um, being in the universe, that's who we believe God is, would it not be a fact that the universe would have to be created by him? How else would it get here? Now, was I there when God said, let there be light? You know, let all of the, the waters separate. Was I there? No. But I'm believing, even though I wasn't there, in the fact of God the creator and that he did these things. Let's talk about some more facts. It's a fact that Moses walked the earth. It's a fact that the people of Israel recorded his encounters with God. It's a fact that they were delivered out of Egypt. It's a fact that the kings of Israel would obey then disobey and prophets would come and try to correct them. It's a fact that then these prophets would prophesy towards the future and that even in the law of Moses there were things looking forward towards the future. Moses said one will come like me even greater than me in the future and it's a fact that Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses, the law of the prophets, and he fulfilled being a king, a priest, a judge, and all of the things that people couldn't do. These are facts. But once again, was I there for that? No, I'm putting my faith in those facts. So if someone wants to ask me, well, why do you believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus literally, literally for the same reasons I believe in Abraham Lincoln. I believe in Abraham Lincoln because I believe in the facts of history. Now, if you want to be a conspiratorialist and be an a Lincolnist, like an atheist, you want to deny the existence of Lincoln, you can go for it. But I have no good reason to doubt these people who recorded the things of the Bible. Now, somebody might say, well, men wrote the Bible. Well, men wrote your math book too. Does that make it wrong? Hey, I'm a man and I'll write down two plus two equals four. Does that make it wrong? Does something have to be written by the hand of God or an angel for it to be right? Truth is truth no matter 
who writes it. Now, we do believe that they penned the scriptures inspired by God. Yes, we believe that. But once again, let's test what they say. Before we believe the claim God told them, let's test what they say. Let's test what the prophets said. Let's test what the apostles said. The prophets and the apostles are the foundation for the church. And when we look at the uh, apostles and the prophets, we see nothing but confirmation. Just an example, when I look to the life of Paul, one of the main authors of the New Testament, I see this man who was once a Jew, who converted to Christianity because of an experience he had, and then he begins to write out these things that confirm with the gospel writers, even though he hasn't even met with them yet, or in depth, or their gospels hadn't been written yet, when you follow those timelines, he has so much of the information that hasn't been publicly released, in other words, and yet he's writing about it in his letters from the mouth of Jesus. How would he know that? Well, he said he met with Jesus for three years. And God explained these things to him and told him to be an apostle to write those scriptures. How about the apostle we're meeting with right, uh, we're reading right now? The apostle of John. We see that John was there, laid his head on the, on the breast of, of the chest of Jesus. He was there at the resurrection. He was actually one of the only disciples at the cross during the crucifixion. We then know that he was exiled because of persecution to an island. And there he has a revelation of Jesus. And he writes these epistles. Let me ask you a question. Why would I? I doubt that. Now, somebody might say, well, then, Joe, if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. Well, let's compare that bridge you have to sell me to the testimony of John. John gets nothing from this. Do you get money when I buy the bridge from you? Or do you get a book sale when I, when I buy this book from you by you seeing an alien or something? John got boiled alive. These disciples got persecuted. What financial gain would they get? Okay, so now that example doesn't work. So what else is John like? Well, he's just a religious con man. Okay, what's he conning for? His other, disciples, his other friends, the disciples, say the same thing. So he doesn't have a unique perspective on that. He's not trying to start his own religion. He's not even trying to be an outspoken person in that way. He's just trying to do his best to tell what he has seen and heard. Okay, so he doesn't fit into the, the, you know, the showman, con man, televangelist, fake healing person. Okay, then what else is he? Oh, he, maybe he was deceived. Maybe he, he's demonically deceived. And another religion like Hinduism is right. Okay, well, what's the evidence that John was was deceived. I look at all of these other religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and they talk about spirits coming upon them. They talk about how they impact, impact them and infect them. Even uh, Muhammad, when he had his first encounter with the angel Gabriel, he thought he was possessed by a demon, tried to jump off a cliff, but his wife stopped him from being suicidal at that time. Well, is that the testimony of John? No, it's the exact opposite. John is the apostle of love. He claims to have walked with, with Jesus. And now John just wants the world to know about him. He doesn't sound demon-possessed at all. So they're not in it for the money. They're not con men. They're not trying to get popularity. And they certainly don't seem like they're demon-possessed, so they're promoting some false religion. We now have to take their claims serious. And what do I come out with at the end? The facts. The facts, and you can look them up. There's a lot of facts about Jesus that even non-Christian historians who study the subject come out with. And there are so many more facts than that that a, a, a lot of people believe. But I'm just talking even non-Christians believe that there was a man named Jesus. That's the center figure. That's the one that we were talking about when it says you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, there's all these facts that even non-Christian historians, Jewish historians, atheist historians agree with, on, with Christians that there was a man named Jesus, he existed, that he did have a group of followers that believed he did miracles, that he was crucified for some kind of disagreement he had with the Jewish people, and that he was claimed to be seen alive, and they couldn't find a grave to disprove the claim that he wasn't in the grave. Those are like minimal facts that you can read a book by Dr. Gary Habermas, who I believe has studied over a thousand different researchers in history about the life of Jesus and has said the great majority, if not all the majority, agree on those uh, minimal facts. And so when we go back to our text, what are we left with? Well, we're left with a choice. Do we want to have faith in Jesus as the Bible describes him to be, because the minimal facts without the Bible make no sense. 
Why in the world would Jewish people all of a sudden start believing in a rebirth that literally is going to happen before a resurrection? Jewish people believed in a resurrection, but they didn't believe in a rebirth before the resurrection. They saw it at the same time. So now why are these Jewish people, because that's the context of Jesus, John's a Jew, all of these first disciples are Jews. Why is it now they believe in a spiritual rebirth? Why is it they now believe they have seen a literal Jesus ascend to heaven and that because of that, that that they are going to be in heaven with that literal Jesus and that now as that spiritual rebirth comes they have that power of the risen Jesus to overcome the world why is it they're preaching that Jesus is the son of God where in the Old Testament they used it generically like we're all the sons and daughters of God but they believe he's the only begotten unique son of God and why are they saying that it's faith in him, not just faith in the Father, but it's faith in him that transforms their world, that gives them power to overcome? Why is that? Because they believe that based on their experience. They recorded what they believed, and now today it's up to you whether or not you believe them. Now, if you're with me up to this point, you go, I believe that. Well, then guess what? Victory is yours. You say, Pastor, you mean all I have to do is believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, believe he's the Christ, the Son of God, and I've got victory? That's right. The Bible teaches us in other places that we are more than conquerors. That doesn't mean that we won't do things in life. That doesn't mean there, there won't be spiritual battles or spiritual growth or challenges. But what it means is we start at the finish line. We start with the gold ribbon, uh, the, the golden medal. We're not trying to earn our salvation. We're not trying to earn our victory. We are simply receiving it at salvation. Let's continue on. Verse 6 says, we overcome the world through faith in Jesus. It says, this is the one who came by water and blood. There were some people at that time that thought Jesus was only a spirit. They denied his actual body, that he had actual blood, that he was born of a virgin, that you know, came through the water breaking. But John is clarifying against what was known as Gnosticism, a false Christian called at that time. He said he did come by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood and blood. So they might have said, well, maybe the spirit just came out of the womb. Somehow, you know, spirits can sometimes touch physical things. So maybe he was made to appear to have a physical body coming out of the womb, but he really didn't have blood on the inside. A partial truth to this is in the resurrection, after the resurrection, Jesus said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, so I believe that what he meant by that is, is that the spiritual body no longer has blood. So I do make a connection there, but unlike the the Gnostics, I don't deny that he had blood at the beginning. He wasn't in a glorified body yet. He was in a body just like ours that could get tired, that could get hungry. He could have low blood sugar. That's why he would have to eat, etc. And when he was on the cross, he bled for us. The Bible says he bled for us. So he didn't just come by water. He came by water and blood. And it is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is truth. Now remember, it was the spirit who came down on his baptism, right? And let's keep going. The King James has this complete. NIV is missing this. And as I've talked about before in manuscripts, I choose the ones that have the more text. And I take that as my guide in the scriptures. Uh, we've talked about that before, that some think that some of these were added later on. These were additions. But I think that these were original to the writings. Okay. And so in the King James, it goes on to say, for there are three that bear record in heaven. And it talks about the Trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So if you just look at it, it's very simple. John's point is this. Jesus was very much a man, yet he was very much God. Remember, it's also his gospel that teaches us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. Right at the beginning of the gospel, we're told Jesus is God. Well, there's going to be a nice little treat at the end of his epistle. So don't think that he forgot to acknowledge the deity of Jesus in this epistle. And his, in his gospel, he acknowledges Jesus' deity right at the beginning. But at the end, you're going to see how he does it. But he's now tying it together 
together with still contradicting the false teaching of his day. If you remember, he said about four or five times already, liar, 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 all throughout his epistle. He's saying, if you say you love God, but you don't keep his commands, you're a liar. If you say you love the Father, but you don't love the Son, you're a liar, and so forth. If you say Jesus didn't come in the flesh, you're a liar. And now he's clarifying that he did not just appear to have flesh or birth forth the water as a spirit in the womb, but he came in uh, in the womb through the water and also blood. He was a very real man. And the Bible says the Spirit of God confirms this, that that's who he is. And remember, we learned that it's the Spirit of God that gives us the anointing, that teaches us all things, that tells us inwardly who Jesus really is. So to kind of tie it back to the beginning with our faith in facts, how do we know we have the right facts? The Spirit guides us in that truth through the Word of God. He guides us in the truth that he has spoken in the Word of God, and he confirms it with our hearts. The Holy Spirit is with us. And so the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in heaven. When Jesus was on earth, he was there by the water and the blood full of the Holy Spirit from his baptism. Isn't this good doctrine? Isn't this a good reminder? I love learning about these things as we continue in our letter. Now let's go to verse 9. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Now notice, this goes exactly to what I was saying. I love it when the preacher preaches before he gets to the apostle preaching. Aren't you enjoying this? This is what I was sharing before. Our faith is in fact, not in fiction. Our faith is in human testimony. Human testimony is a great way to understand what has happened in the past or if you weren't there, whether it's written or oral. It's an important way to learn things. Obviously, they didn't have video cameras. They didn't have audio recording devices. How else would you know anything at that time? And not only at that time, but all times before the modern technological age. Like I was saying, I believe in Jesus for the same reasons I believe in Abraham Lincoln. I witness testimony based on fact. Okay, and John is saying that's important that we believe human testimony, but he says God's testimony is even greater. And what did God say, the Father, about his son? Well, you go back to the baptism, the day that the Spirit is coming upon Jesus, he says, this is my beloved son. Now, once again, you would have to believe the testimony of the disciples that God said that, and I trust them. And I trust that God spoke that to them. Here's one of the reasons why I believe that God spoke that to them. Because in the Gospels, the disciples are the slow learners. They're the Oompa Loompas. They're still not getting it. Even after the resurrection, the women get it before them. So why would they make it so embarrassing for themselves when in this time, legend and folklore always made the heroes look good? You know, Why would you make yourself look so bad and the women look so good and and Peter even being called Satan, who's supposed to be the star of the show. This is because, honestly, they are reporting to you their slow learning of the nature of Jesus and his, in his uh, mission on the earth. And yet it's so real and relatable to us because how many of us, come on, chat amen, if you've been a slow learner? How many of you have had to have Jesus call you Satan a few times like Peter or like doubting Thomas going, hey, I still don't believe it. I have to touch. You know, how many of us have been like that? So I'm so grateful that God is patient with us to give us multiple testimonies. And I even believe this, that not only God does God testify about it in the past, about Jesus being his son, but he testifies about it in the present. I have a book somewhere here on my shelf, Mosque and Miracles, and it talks about how so many Muslims come to Christ through the miracles of encounters with Christ while still being a Muslim. So I encourage you, if you want to hear about testimonies of God still testifying about his son and Jesus himself showing up, Check out the book, Mosque and Miracles. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest ways that people from other religions come to Christ is through having encounters personally with God. So God's testimony is obviously greater. Let's go to verse 10 as we continue reading on. The Bible then goes on to say, Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. 
So not only would this include world religions being considered liars, like Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., but this would also consider Christian cults liars, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, weird religions like Scientology. Anyone who denies the God, the God of the Bible being Father, Son, and Spirit, and the Son being the unique person who took on flesh and died for our sins so that we might be saved and have eternal life. Anyone who denies what I've been preaching about all here is a liar. No matter what other good things they say, when it comes to the most important subject of the world, who is Jesus, they are liars. Anyone who denies Jesus is the unique Son of God, equal with the Father, sent down to take on flesh, to die on the cross for our sins, which the previous chapters have already clarified as well, so that we might be born of God, filled with the Spirit, like anyone who denies that is a liar. That doesn't mean they lie about everything else. There may be some truths in Hinduism. There may be some good exercises there, right? There may be some truths in Islam. There may be some truths in Mormonism. There may be some truths in Scientology. Not many, I can guarantee you that if you've ever studied it. But there may be some truth, right? But here's the point. In the most important subject, on the most important subject, if they don't have Jesus right, they're a liar and you're not to follow them. And as we learned in the previous chapters, there are many antichrists, people against Christ, that we should avoid. And verse 11 says, and this is the testimony God has given. He's given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. So a lot of people might say, well, I believe in God. Okay, but listen, but if you don't believe in his son, the way the Bible teaches, you don't have eternal life from him. God the Father only gives life, eternal life, through God the Son. And so whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now that confirms perfectly with John chapter 3 verse 18. That is not just here in the epistle of John. That is also in the gospel of John. After John 3 16, look at what John says. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Not just a son, like in the sense like we're all sons of God once we're born of God, we're children of God in that way. No, in the unique sense, equal to the father he is the monogenous the unique one he's the only one that has the genes the monogenous that's it's, it, the word in the greek mono one genes like how we would say genes he is the only one that has the dna of the father born of a virgin lived a sinless life you must believe that if you want to be saved anyone who denies that is a liar according to first john but let's keep going and then we'll conclude with overcoming the world let's see if you can see as we get to the, uh, the deity of Christ here towards the end, see if you can catch it. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. How many believe? Can I hear a, Can I see a chat amen right now? How many believe in Jesus as the Son of God today? Amen. You have eternal life. You're not just waiting to die to get eternal life. You have eternal life now. Verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we have asked of him. And that's also in John's gospel as well. The idea of having the blank check of God or the limitless credit card of God is tied to his will. Whenever we're praying God's will, it's his bill. It's not just all of our wants, it's the needs, the things God wants us to have. So don't be discouraged when you pray and something doesn't come about. Either it's not God's will or not God's timing. And then you can ask him, which one is it? Is it not your timing, God? Because otherwise I'll keep praying because you told me to knock and keep knocking, seek and keep seeking. Or God, if it's not your will, help me to pray for something that is your will. Let's continue on. Verse 16. We get into what could be a controversial subject, but I won't spend much time on it. Verse 16 says, If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. So the idea is if someone sins, pray for each other to be forgiven. James talks about the same thing. A priest does not have to be involved. Confess your sins one to another, he says, and you will be healed. Here's the same idea. You will have life. Sins will be forgiven. He says, I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that they should pray about that. 
All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Now, before we think John's contradicting himself, let's just make sure we understand the context. When we sin, we can pray for each other to get life. We got that, right? But then now he says, there's a sin that we shouldn't pray for. But then he says, but all wrongdoing is sin. And then he reiterates what he had just said before about this one kind of sin. Do I think he's contradicting himself? All sin is wrongdoing, and then there's a sin that we shouldn't pray for. No, what he is talking about is the sin of backsliding. I cannot pray for you to be forgiven of backsliding. Backsliding or you turning away from Christ is a decision that you and only you can make. I can pray that you come to Christ. I can pray that others will preach to you, that God will be patient with you, and that you will call out for forgiveness. But I cannot say to God, please forgive them of their apostasy or of their denial of you. Because for me to pray that, I would be praying against the judgment of God. The judgment of God, as we've already read in the verses prior, is against those who do not believe, as we've read in the gospel as well. So the judgment's already been set. I'm not trying to change God's mind over that. When we're praying for lost people, we're praying that they will confess their sins to be forgiven by confessing Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And for extra reference there, I brought up Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, talking about how backsliding generally works. It's deliberately sinning over and over and over again without genuine repentance, and it cuts you off from God. And then for you to be saved at that point, Jesus would have to be crucified all over again. Another sacrifice would have to be given because you've already trampled on the sacrifice that has been given. Now you might ask, can a backslider be saved? Absolutely. What do they have to do? Believe in the same sacrifice that they once rejected. But they cannot expect to reject that sacrifice of Jesus 2,000 years ago and die and somehow be forgiven another way. There is no other way. And Jesus called this the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, the person of the Trinity that we have an intimate relationship that convicts us, that guides us in the spirit spiritual rebirth that literally makes us new creations is the Holy Spirit. So if we blaspheme and reject the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we reject him convicting us, then it's impossible to be saved because we can only repent of what we're convicted of. Does everybody get that? You can only repent what you know to repent from, you know? You can only confess what you know to confess from or, or to confess to or confess about rather. And the Holy Spirit has to be a part of that process. But if you're denying the Holy Spirit, none of that can happen. So John is reminding us that from beginning to end, salvation is a God thing. And if we reject God in that process, we can't be saved. And we can't even ask others to pray for us to be saved. We have to be saved by our choice. Uh, so you could pray for them to be saved by their choice. But remember, ev everyone has that choice. So it's not like you hear about Judas going to betray Jesus. It, it's not like Peter could then look at, look at Jesus and go, well, let's pray that Peter's will doesn't do that. You know, it's not like Jesus is going to change uh, Judas's will and make him a puppet now and not betray him. We're given that choice. So I hope that you understand that no one's prayer can stop your choice. And God himself will not stop your choice. He allows you to go to hell if you want to. But I pray you choose Jesus Christ. Use your freedom, your free will to come to Christ. Now let's go in closing here. What we know. Come on, somebody say, I know. Chat, we know. Come on, we know. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. That will not be their habit. Their default will be living righteous. And chapter 2 said, if we do sin, we can be forgiven. He's our propitiation. He's our sacrifice. Not only ours, but for the whole world. But what we're not going to do is continue in it. The one who is born of God keeps them safe. The evil one cannot harm them. Do you see now how we overcome the world? Come on, somebody. When you believe in Jesus and you got your doctrine right, the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you. And if you do sin, you can pray and be forgiven. But guess what? That's not going to be your pattern. It's just, you know, sinning and being forgiven, sinning and being forgiven. Your pattern is not continuing in sin because Jesus keeps you safe. The evil one cannot harm you. We know that we are children of God 
and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come to give us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Hallelujah. Woo! There he ends with a bang right there. He teaches us that when we're born of God, we overcome the world, but he wants to make sure we got our doctrine right. So he takes his time to explain what it's like to believe in Jesus and the way we're supposed to do that. And then he says, we, you know, if we do sin, we can pray for each other and be forgiven. But our habit, our habitual nature is not to continue in sin. It's to live in righteousness because the devil can't harm us. There is not one time when you're tempted and you pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil, that God's going to say, well, Angels, I don't think I can help them this time. The evil one is too strong. Their flesh is too great. No, in the prior chapter it says, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We have overcome the world through Jesus Christ. We overcome our sin through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not just a mere man trying to become God. He is not just an angel. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. Does that sound now just like the John we know and love from his gospel in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Isn't it the Gospel of John that reminds us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This epistle ends with a bang. I love John's epistle. I hope that you've enjoyed it. But oh, hold on. We're not done yet. <laughs> There's more. Just when we thought it was done. Amen, John, I agree. Jesus is God and I want to live for him, be born of him, keep his commands, overcome the world. I want to do that. John says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Oh, isn't that something? That right at the end of preaching the greatness of Jesus Christ and who he is, the true, real God, God made manifest in the flesh, one that came to bear witness of the Father and the Spirit in heaven. Isn't it something that right at the end, he becomes very practical, stepping on our toes and says, hey, listen, you better keep yourself away from idols. Why do you think he said that? Do you think that he thought that those uh, followers there were going to start worshiping idols like Krishna or the gods of the Greeks and the Romans? Do you think that he was all of a sudden thinking that they were just going to start worshiping idols like this and now, I, I think it includes that, obviously, but I think what he meant was the idols of the heart. Those things that we put before our relationship with God, idols of selfish ambition, idols of vain conceit, vanity, the idols of pride, the idol of perversion and sexual pleasure, the idol of unteachability, thinking one is always right. The idol of all of those things that so subtly, subtly tempt us to think that we can worship God and another thing, a thing that's less than God. I believe John is warning his folks as he's warning us today that if you're not careful and you have all of this right, but if you're not careful, your heart can produce idols and drift you away from God. It reminds me of Paul's warning in Ephesus, of the book of Ephesians to the people of Ephesus. He had just gone through all of this lofty theology in him, in Christ, seated in heavenly places, blessed with every spiritual blessing. And yet he ends with a warning. Never lose your first love. I believe it's the same kind of warning that John is giving us. The warning of guarding our heart from putting things before God. I hope that this epistle has blessed you. I hope that's encouraged you. Go back and listen to all of it together if you want to see it in context and in the whole. But as we end it today, I pray that if you and I have any idols in our heart, God will expose them. And if you have not yet been born of God, today you'll deny the greatest idol. That's yourself. 
and you'll worship the true and living God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for this wonderful, powerful epistle through the Apostle John to teach us how to overcome the world, to be born of you, to have faith in you, O God, to keep your commands, to live like you. I pray that we will do this by faith, O Lord. And if anyone's listening to me and has not yet done it, they'll be born again. They'll repent of their sins and confess you as the Lord of their life. And Lord, if there are any backsliders or compromisers here that want you and an idol, they want you and something else in their life that is not you, but it still has lordship or master, masterhood over their life, I pray they repent of those idols. And you cleanse their hearts so that they'll only have you. Jesus, make us wholly yours, fully in love with you, living our lives dedicated to you. It's in your son's name we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who join the live feed, if you would like prayer right now, please put up your name. If you would like to join discipleship, also do that. If you have a private prayer request, just say it's private. Someone will reach out to you of the same gender. We have life groups meeting all throughout this week online. Everybody in the greater church body around the world are welcome to them. But if you're local and you want to be in the Zoom accountability or in the Zoom discipleship, let us know and we'll get you into that as well as our Sunday Zoom. I love you. I am so encouraged by the support of, of the church online. Thank you for helping make these sermons go out to the vast community and to our friends and family. And I pray that you are born of God and that you will overcome the world. Have a great week, and God bless.